All right, let's find a seat here as we begin our equipping hour. Please find a seat. All right, let me open us up in prayer as we begin. God, we just uh, thank you again for another day of life. Uh, we thank you for uh, your power to cause the sun to, to rise again this morning. Uh, we thank you for your grace, uh, your mercy that is just true and evident again today. So I pray that we would just continue to trust in your promises, Lord. I pray that we would be humble under your word. I pray that we would be encouraged by your word, Lord. And I pray that our lives would walk in accordance with what you say. I pray these things, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Well, my name is Kyle Frazee. If you don't know me, I am a seminary student here at the Expositor Seminary. And we've been talking last week and this week about uh, a method, a faithful method for gospel ministry. Uh, the method that we see in Paul as he comes to Thessalonica. So we're going to look again today at 1 Thessalonians. And we're talking again about Paul's priority, his method in ministry. How he came, what he prioritized. Last week we looked at the message, we looked at gospel proclamation in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. This week we're going to look at the messenger, the character of the gospel messenger. See, the message and the messenger are not disconnected. You must have the right message and you must have the right character. You must have the right motivations. We talked briefly last week about pragmatism. Uh, about a method of ministry that would be results-based, that would look for uh, a method based on what works, what is most efficient, what gets you to the, the quickest, best results. Not, not important what you do or how you do it as much as that you get an outcome that you're looking for. That would be pragmatism. That would be doing God's business man's way and just by way of introduction this morning, uh, I was just reading this last week in Leviticus, and just want to just show you a biblical example of pragmatism, two of the ultimate pragmatists in the Old Testament. So if you turn to Leviticus chapter 8, again, just by way of introduction, Leviticus chapter 8, and I'll start in verse 1 just to, to let you know where we're at in this story. We have Moses consecrating Aaron and his sons to be priests to the Lord. So chapter 8, verse 1, Then Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Take Aaron and his sons with him, and the garments, and the anointing oil, and the bull of the sin offering, and the two rams, and the basket of unleavened bread, and assemble the congregation. So Moses does all of this. And then verse 6 of chapter 8, and Then Moses and Aaron and his sons came near and washed. Sorry, Moses had Aaron and his sons come near, and he washed them with water. So you have this consecration of, of Aaron and his sons for the priesthood. And if you turn to chapter 9, verse 7, Moses then said to Aaron, Come near to the altar and offer your sin offering and your burnt offering that you may make atonement for yourself and for the people. In verse 9, Aaron's sons presented the blood to him, and, dipped his, and he dipped his finger in the blood and put some on the horns of the altar and poured out the rest of the blood on the base of the altar. So what you have going on here is this consecration of Aaron and his sons for the priesthood. And at the end of chapter 9, verse 22, we see God approving this consecration. 9.22, Aaron lifted up his hands toward the people and blessed them, and he stepped down after making the sin offering and the burnt offering and the peace offerings. Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meeting. When they came out and blessed the people, the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. Then fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the portions of fat on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. So God is pleased with the, the worship on his terms. 
And then we see in the next verse, uh, the pragmatism, the ultimate pragmatism of Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, who have been part of this ceremony, who have been prepared for worship. Chapter 10, verse 1. Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took their respective firepans, and after putting fire in them, placed incense on it, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So you see, God had given this clear instruction for how he was to be worshipped, for what they were to do, for how they were to do ministry uh, in service to the Lord. And Nadab and Abihu here presume on the Lord. They don't assume, they don't assume that his clear instruction is important. They think that they might have a better approach. They do things their way. They elevate themselves. They put themselves in a seat of authority. And this is pragmatism. We're going to decide what we think is best, how we are going to worship the Lord on our terms. You could see them saying, we're worshiping here. We're just trying to worship the Lord. But they do it through their own method. They are rogue worshipers here. They don't follow God's prescriptions. Again, this is man-centered ministry. And we see God's response, verse 2 of chapter 10. And fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. So just again to highlight the importance of a, a faithful method of ministry, uh, God was not pleased with their rogue worship, deciding to do ministry on their terms, deciding to do what they thought would be the most effective way to serve the Lord. You see, God was the main event in their worship, and they wanted to be part of the event. They wanted to do things where they, they got some credit, they got some glory with the Lord. So we see why this is important, not just for worship, but for evangelism, for church ministry, why we must do God's business God's way. In our evangelism, are we holding God high as we preach the gospel? God graciously allows us to participate with him in what he is doing in the world. And that's why, that's why it matters. That's why our method matters. How we do ministry matters. So we're going to see in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, we're going to see a lot about how to do ministry, how to do evangelism, the character of the gospel witness. So if you would turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, we'll be working through verses 1 through 8. We're going to be looking at what I'm calling three essential characteristics of a faithful gospel messenger. Three essential characteristics of a faithful gospel messenger. And we're going to see this again in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. So read with me, beginning in verse 1. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain, but after we had already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amidst much opposition. For our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. For we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with pretext for greed, God is witness, nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, even though as apostles of Christ we might have asserted our authority, but we proved to be gentle among you, as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children, having so fond an affection for you that we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become very dear to us. So we see in this, in this passage, Paul is talking about how he came to Thessalonica, the way that he came, his method as he comes to Thessalonica to bring the gospel. We looked last week at Acts 17. If you remember Paul in Acts 17, he's on his second missionary journey. He's traveling through Macedonia and Achaia, and he comes from Philippi to Thessalonica. And in Philippi, we looked at Paul beaten, bloody, beat up, comes immediately from Philippi to Thessalonica, starts preaching the gospel. 
And in chapter 1, verse 5, and 4 and 5, Paul says that he is confident of the salvation of this church because of the way that the gospel came. He is confident that they embraced the gospel. And we looked at last time five non-negotiables for faithful evangelism. Paul's method, how he preached the gospel, what he preached. And now we're going to see Paul talk about his character. He says that, that you know that our coming to you was not in vain in verse 1. He's talking about his coming to them, how he was when he came to Thessalonica. And Paul gives this defense to them of his character, not because he's worried about what people think of them, of him, but he's worried about them hanging on to the truth. Right? If they undermine the gospel messenger, then they're, they're going to reject his message. And you can see for a, a church where Paul has been, he's out of town very quickly. He's, he's there for a short period. He's run out of town. Now this church, their lives are turned upside down. And to, to ask the question, well, where's Paul? Where's the guy that, that said all these hard truths to us? Now our lives are hard, and where did Paul go? So you can see him feeling the need to, to instruct them on his character. Here's how I came, remember how I came, so that they would continue to embrace his message, so that they would continue to hold on to the truth that he gave them. So he's encouraging them to be faithful. He's not, he's not after trying to put himself on a pedestal He's holding up his ministry so they continue to believe his words, so that they continue to hold to the scripture. So that's why he's defending his ministry here. And we might do this as a parent, or at least I, I do this sometimes. You know, you're having maybe a hard day with the kids and you remind them, you know, mom and dad love you. We want what's best for you. You know that, right? And your kids, yes, we know that. Okay, so you need to do this. You need to listen, you know, just reminding them of what they know to be true about you, about your character, so that they would listen, so that they would continue to receive instruction. So that's what Paul is doing here. And he gives us his priorities for ministry, his method, as he defends his character. So we're going to see three essential characteristics of a faithful gospel messenger. Three essential characteristics of a faithful gospel messenger. Number one, the messenger must be driven by faithfulness, not results. Driven by faithfulness, not results. Verses 1 and 2. And we see in this passage a series of statements that Paul makes where he says, I came not like this, but like this. And he does this three times in this passage. We came not like this, but like this. So through these three statements, we're going to see these three characteristics and it's really instructive for us that Paul really gives us a, a full orb picture of here's what I'm talking about. It's not like this, but it's like this. So we'll see three of these. The first one in verses one and two, you can see where he says that our coming to you was not in vain, but after we suffered, we had boldness to speak. So it was not like this, but it was like this. In verse three, we're going to see the same thing. He says, our exhortation does not come from error, impurity, deceit, but... Like this is how it came. Verse 5, he says, We never came with flattery. We never came with pretext for greed. Verse 6, we never came seeking glory from men. But, verse 7, we proved to be gentle. So again, these opposite statements, these contrasts that Paul gives to show us his method of ministry. The first one, Paul says, Our coming to you was not vain, but... After we had suffered and been mistreated, we had boldness to speak, speak our, to speak the gospel of our God in the midst of opposition. So not this, and I think we have it on the slide, it says not this, our coming to you was not in vain, but we had boldness to speak. Let me just read to you real quick in Acts 16, just to get an idea. When he says that the, the suffering that he had in Philippi just so you have an idea of what happened specifically in Philippi, what he had to overcome is he's coming to Thessalonica and he has to be bold again after Philippi. And I'll just read to you, you can just listen. In Acts 16, verse 19, Paul says that they had seized, I'm sorry, Acts, as Luke says in Acts, that they had seized Paul and Silas. They dragged them to the marketplace before the authorities. And when they had brought them to the chief magistrates, they said, these men are throwing our city into confusion, being Jews, and are proclaiming customs, which is not lawful for us to accept, us being Romans. And the crowd rose up together against them, 
And the chief magistrates tore their robes off of them and proceeded to order them, this is Paul and Silas, to be beaten with rods. And when they had struck them with many blows, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely. And having received such a command, he threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. So we see in, in Philippi the suffering that he's talking about. He's drugged before officials, beaten with rods, many blows. He's thrown into prison. His feet are put in stocks. So that's where he's coming from. That's the, the, his boldness to preach the gospel is coming from that environment, coming from a situation where he had just been beaten, bloody, in prison, feet in stocks. And now he comes to, to Thessalonica, and he has boldness. He preaches the same message. And he gets persecuted again in Thessalonica. He gets run out of town. The Jews in Thessalonica are so angry at Paul that they follow him to the next city, Berea, and they kick him out of Berea. So that's the kind of hostility that Paul is dealing with. So when he says he had boldness to speak, he is saying he is still bloody, beaten from Philippi, wounds, maybe don't even have scabs yet, black and blue. And just think there might be a temptation to fear, right? There would be a, a great temptation to fear. He is, his body is frail. His body has been beaten, and he's going to the synagogue to preach the same message to the same hostile crowd. You know, we are fearful of being, you know, seen as different, offending someone, maybe having a hard conversation, someone not liking us. Well, for Paul here, there's, there's real hostility on display that he has to overcome. And he has supernatural boldness in this hostility. So now back to the, to the point here. He says, our coming was not in vain, but we spoke with boldness. So the contrast is vain, coming, bold proclamation. And just think for a minute about this contrast. When you hear, our coming was not in vain, our coming was not futile, our coming was not worthless or pointless, at least in my mind, I would think the opposite of that would be it was fruitful. It wasn't fruitless, it wasn't worthless, it was fruitful. But that's not what he's saying. He's not saying it wasn't vain because there was fruit. He's not saying it wasn't vain because there was conversion, because people believed. That's not what he says. He, he contrasts a vain, a futile coming to them with being bold in his proclamation. So it would have been vain if Paul had not spoken boldly. It would have been futile. It would have been a waste if he had not faithfully declared God's message with boldness. So Paul is faithful here. He speaks God's truth faithfully, and that's why it wasn't in vain. It wasn't a waste because Paul is empowered by God to be faithful in his proclamation. He didn't shrink in fear. He didn't run away from conflict. If we were driven by results, if Paul was driven by results, he might say it was in vain because it was fruitful. There were converts. That's why it wasn't a waste. But Paul first says it was in vain because I was able to humbly trust the Lord for boldness. His proclamation honored Christ, even in the midst of persecution. So that's a win in God's eyes. That's why it wasn't futile. That's why it wasn't vain. Think of just so much in the modern church about metrics, church growth, so much about a results-oriented, how do we get bigger, faster? And that's just not it for Paul. He is not worried about church growth as, a, as an indicator for faithfulness. Him being faithful is preaching the gospel one day at a time, one conversation at a time, honoring the Lord in his proclamation. So just think in your life, a measure of faithfulness in conversations, in bold proclamation. Was I faithful in that conversation? Was I faithful in the way that I presented truth with my coworker, with my family member? Just think about church planning, Gilbert, New Orleans, Papua New Guinea, what would faithfulness look like in those places? What if there are no converts? What if there are no, no new people added into the church in Gilbert, in New Orleans? No believers in Papua New Guinea? No converts, but if Josh and Omri, Zach preach the word, 
in season and out of season, that would be faithful. Even if no one believes, it would still be faithful. God would still be pleased with that. And obviously, Paul wants people to be saved. That's why he's there, right? He wants conversion. He wants to see sinners repent and believe in Christ. That's why he's willing to endure. But the, the measure of his faithfulness is not in their response. The measure of his faithfulness is in his bold proclamation. And he says with boldness, this is with conviction, with steadfast confidence that he believed this message to be true. He's willing to suffer for it. Last week after uh, the sermon, I said to my wife, man, Zach can can preach. That was really good. And I thought about it afterward and was like, why did I think that he did such a good job? And it's because he was bold. He was clear with God's word. He said it with conviction. Right? He preached the text. And he believed it. You could tell he believed what he was saying. That's why, man, he can preach because he believes this. Because he's bold with the truth. He's clear with the truth. Uh, my wife and I were in a situation recently where we saw the opposite. We saw someone uh, read a rehearsed gospel line. They're reading things that are true of Christ, but it's from a script and it was impassionate, uh, without zeal, no explanation, no appeal to believe it. It just didn't seem like it mattered to the one who was presenting this. And there's just something off when you're presenting these great truths of the gospel and to say it with, with no, no passion, with no authority, with no appeal, that's not bold proclamation. And people are wired different, so I'm not saying that it has to be a, a certain level of emotion, but there is a, a conviction. Do you believe this, what you're saying? Do you believe it? Are you willing to suffer for it? The only message by which people must be saved is the gospel. We must declare this message boldly. And Paul says he has boldness in our God. In verse 2, we had boldness in our God to speak. This is a certain kind of boldness. This is not a boldness that just says, I need to suck it up more. I need to try a little harder. But this is being willing to stand for the truth with confidence in God. Paul, Paul is a human here needing supernatural help. I think we forget sometimes that Paul is a man like us. You read these great acts of Paul. He is a, a human, same flesh that we have, uh, same temptation toward fear, same temptation toward a love of comfort. Paul needs supernatural strength to preach this message boldly. He needs the Holy Spirit to empower him. He still has to fight sinful fear. Again, he is bloody and beaten from Philippi, persecuted. He's coming to Thessalonica knowing it's going to be the same thing. This is what happens in every city. And he has to fight uh, temptation to fear. And he needs God to empower him in this bold proclamation. He needs supernatural strength. And Paul here goes right to the synagogue. He goes right to the Jews who are going to persecute him. He preaches boldly. He doesn't show up at some side alley. He doesn't start whispering to folks about Jesus where it's convenient, where there's not going to be as much confrontation. Uh, he shows right back up at the synagogue. He starts preaching. You see, Paul didn't need a, a change of circumstances when he got to Thessalonica. He didn't need less hostility. He didn't need to change his message. He didn't need to try to be more compelling to that culture. How do I repackage this for a new culture, a new people? What he needed was supernatural boldness to preach the same message to a hostile people, to have faith in God and his word. And we see in Acts 17 that there are people who believe. There are results here. Paul's faithful proclamation did lead to, to people embracing the gospel because he was faithful, because he trusted the Lord in his bold proclamation. See, Paul sees rightly where the power comes from, his absolute confidence in God's power in the gospel. And that brings us to our second point, Second essential characteristic of a faithful gospel messenger. First was he must be driven by faithfulness, not results. The second is the messenger is one who comes under authority. He is not a swindler. 
He's under authority. He's not one who's representing himself. He is representing another. Have you ever been scammed? Have you ever been told an elaborate story by a con artist, someone that uh, built you up and then was out to take your money? I remember the first time that I was, was scammed. Um, I was at a gas station. I was probably 19 years old. And this guy had a story of his car was broken down. He was on his way home from work. He works at the restaurant just down the street. You can call the restaurant and you can see, you know, they'll, they'll know my name over there. And he just needs 20 bucks to fill up his gas tank or to get repairs, to get home. And uh, it was an elaborate story, right? And he was, he was very believable. So I gave him $20. It was all, probably all the money I had in the world at the time. And then uh, two weeks later, I go to that same gas station, fill up my gas, and the next pump over, I hear this story about this guy whose car had broken down, who just needed $20 to get home from work, and uh, just realized like, in that moment that I'd, I'd been scammed. Uh, I think of another story, uh, a friend that I used to work with, a, a shrewd uh, finance guy, tells the story of him at, also at a gas station. I guess that's where the, the scams happen, is gas stations. But this, this man had these, these jackets and he was about to get on a plane and he has these leather jackets and he can't take them on the plane with him. He was here for a conference, you know, obviously elaborate story. So I'll, I'll sell these to you for, you know, five bucks each or 20 bucks each, they're hundred dollar jackets. And my friend who is very shrewd, falls for the story, buys all these jackets, one for each family member, he buys, you know, hundred dollars worth of these jackets comes home, finds out this is just fake, you know, made in China leather that's $5 each, so he spends $100 for $20 worth of uh, Halloween costumes, you know. <laughs> and uh, that's a scam, right? They want something from you. They tell you a story. They're after their own ends. Impure motives, a deceitful message. There's sleight of hand, right? This long story with no substance. Paul says, I didn't come deceiving you. I didn't come telling you something false. He didn't come scamming them. But he, he came to please God. Paul was a man under authority. He didn't come from his own agenda. He came for God's agenda. In verse 3, he says, Our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit, Look at verse 4, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not pleasing men, but God. So he's approved by God. Paul is not a, a self-authenticated, self-proclaimed messenger. He is God's messenger. He's approved by God. God approves his ministry. He has been found faithful to be entrusted with this message. Paul is not just a passionate guy who says, man, I love people and I love the gospel, I'm gonna go preach. All right, he's actually an agent of the Messiah. He's actually been approved for this message, for this work. He's been entrusted, he says, with the gospel because he has been approved. God's message, this is not Paul's message. He is just a steward here of God's truth. And again, Paul is not under his own authority. He's not after his own purposes. He's not self-appointed. This is God's work. This is God's message. This says a lot about, we think about ministry, pastoral ministry, missions even. Some people think, man, I have a, I have a desire for missions. I should, be a, I, I should be a missionary because I have a desire. And it's like, that's great. You need to have a desire. But you also need to be approved. You need to be tested. You need to be found faithful. It's been encouraging to uh, take some seminary classes with Daniel Bruce. I don't know if you, if you all have met Daniel and Sarah Bruce, but they have a, a desire, a passion to, to bring the gospel to unreached people groups. Um, they're training, part of Finister Vision right now, I believe, and training at the seminary to be sent out. And it's been encouraging just to see a, a young couple that is on fire for the Lord, that wants to see the gospel go, that has a passion, and at the same time is saying, and we wanna be trained, we wanna be equipped. We want to be sent out by a church. We want to be found faithful and sent. And that's, what, that's what Paul is modeling here for us, a faithfulness. The missionary here who is faithful, who has been approved, who has been tested, is not a self-declared ministry. This is what it looks like to do missions as one under authority. So I'm going to do missions the way that God defines it. I'm going to go as one under authority. 
And part of that authority is being sent by a local church, being proven in character. So much in our culture is just, are you passionate? Are you a good speaker? Okay, great. You should be a pastor. You should be a missionary. No, are they faithful? Are they faithful? And do they have the giftedness to do that, do that work? And I'm not saying that you need a resume to share the gospel. All of us should be evangelists. We must be evangelists. But we must preach the gospel as one under authority. Our desire to please the Lord with God as our ultimate audience. Paul says, we did not speak as pleasing men, but God. God, his glory, was the goal. So Paul's result is pleasing the Lord. That's the result he's after. How do I please the Lord? So is God's pleasure worth it to you? If you are rejected by men, if you are rejected in this life, are you willing to lose friends have family members upset at you, maybe sacrifice career opportunities, maybe live a harder life, but you can please the Lord regardless of the cost? Is that worth it to you? We see here the opposite of one who would come under authority, who would desire to be pleasing to the Lord. Back up to verse three, the, the one who would come with an exhortation from error or impurity, or by way of deceit. Error would be a, a false religion, something false, something not divine, just what's popular, just another human message. That would be to come in error. That's every false religion, right? Every false religion doesn't condemn man. It says that man is pretty good. He needs to try a little harder. Just work a little harder, then you can get to heaven. And this book, the Bible, is the only book that condemns man. It's the only book that says that man is actually the problem. That man actually doesn't have the answer in himself. That's the message Paul preaches. He preaches one under authority, saying this word says that you actually stand condemned before God. You actually need a solution outside of yourself. Paul says he also doesn't come with impure motives. This would be not pleasing the Lord, obviously, but pleasing self seeking a personal platform, seeking personal gain, wanting personal significance, just wanting to be in front of people, wanting an audience. And it's helpful to see what's going on at the heart level here. If you were to come as one who is not under authority, it would be because you're coming from an impure motive. When someone proclaims a message on their own authority, when someone preaches a man-centered message, there is an issue with their motives. That comes from an impure motive. Something is going on in the heart that would lead you to shrink away from declaring God's message on God's terms. It is possible to do ministry, to do ministry as we would define it, maybe not as God defines it, with impure motives. You see people in the church today, you see pastors fall, pastors fall into sexual immorality because they have impure motives. And it could be much more subtle than that. It could be just a love for people listening to your voice, just a desire to be liked. It feels good to have friends, to be liked, to have people listen to you. But that's not one who is saying, I wanna please the Lord. Paul is saying, I just wanna get out of the way. If I can hold up God's truth and be invisible, I can be content with that. But the one who comes with impure motives says, I want to be on display. I want to get the credit. Think about Nadab and Abihu. They want to be part of the show. They're not putting God high on display. Lastly, in verse 3, he says, we did not come by way of deceit. This is the, the trickster, the huckster, the charlatan, the one who's trying to get you to believe his story so he can con you. Paul is not doing a bait and switch here. He's not manipulating, not a promise for this, and then giving them something else. He's not, not showing up with a pony ride in a bounce house and a tailgate and saying, we're gonna sprinkle some Jesus into this message, but not so much that they are offended. No, Paul is clear and he is bold. 
He's not just trying to get people in the door on Sunday and then we'll tell them the hard truths on Wednesday. Well, let's just get them here on Sunday. Paul says he doesn't do that. He doesn't come with a, a two-way message saying one thing here and one thing here. He says the same things to any audience that will listen. Paul is one under authority. Just think about so much, we talk about pragmatism. I think the fruit of so much pragmatism is not being under authority. Again, Nadab and Abihu do not see themselves as, as those under authority. They're not trembling at God's words. And Paul here points to, to God's authority, not his own. Think about Paul here who did miracles, who saw the resurrected Christ, who was sent as an apostle, says that he actually has a vision of heaven, and yet he, he does not point to his own authority. He's pointing to God's authority over and over again. He points to the authority of the Lord. He's telling them these things because he is under authority, not because he is the authority. He points to God. He's delegated. He has a delegated authority. Parents, this is the same for us. Right? We have delegated authority, not worried that our kids disobey us, but that they, that they would obey the Lord. Right? It is a delegated authority, not enforcing our wills on our kids, but actually God's will on our kids. Same for husbands. We have delegated authority. We must point our wives to the Lord, to his authority. This is what Paul is doing. He's pointing to God's authority. He's living under authority and pointing to God's authority. That's how you wield spiritual authority. So in evangelism, we must see ourselves as under authority, as delegates. And in all of life, in our work, in our parenting, do you see yourself as one under authority? Do I go to work on Monday as one under authority? And this is a stewardship here that Paul is referring to, this entrustment of the gospel. He's entrusted, he is a steward of this message. Using this delegated authority for God's pleasure, not for self. And look what he says at the end of verse four. He says that he is not seeking to please men, but he seeks to please God who examines our hearts. So Paul is saying here, he doesn't need to validate his, his ministry to anyone but the Lord. God is the one who examines our hearts. God is the one who knows our motives. He's the one who tests the motives. He knows our faithfulness. He sees what no one else sees. So we just trust him to validate our ministry. Be faithful to his word and trust him. He's the one who validates ministry. So what does it look like to be a faithful gospel witness as one under authority? Well, it dictates what you say, dictates how you say it, obviously means bold proclamation. If people in Papua New Guinea are gonna believe, there must be bold proclamation of Jesus. If your friends, your neighbors, your family members are gonna believe, there must be bold proclamation of the Lord. You must be willing to say hard things. Never compromising truth, but just a, a humble desire to please the Lord. It's his truth. We're just the messengers. So for Paul, man was not the ultimate audience. God was the ultimate audience. So we don't have an option to decide what we think is the most effective way to do ministry. We're under authority. If man is offended, but God is honored, his truth is held high, that's a win. If Christ is honored in our proclamation, just think about that in your conversations that you have with, with friends, with coworkers. Are you considering God first? Will the Lord be pleased in this conversation? Consider what must I say in this conversation to uphold God's truth, to uphold his character, and to uphold my own integrity. Being under authority means you won't run over your own character. Right, there's no harshness here from Paul. 
And that's going to bring us to our last point. So third essential characteristic of a faithful gospel messenger. First, we looked at faithfulness, not results. We looked at one who comes as under authority. And lastly, we have one who is focused on a, a sacrificial love, not self-love. The gospel messenger must be one who is characterized by sacrificial love, not self-love. In the last contrasting statement we, hear, we see here from Paul, verses 6 and 7, he says, we did not seek glory from men. Sorry, verses 5 and 6, he says, we did not come with flattering speech. We did not come with a pretext for greed. Nor, verse 6, did we seek glory from men. And then verse 7, the contrast, but we prove to be gentle. So he says, no flattering speech, no pretext for greed, no glory from men, but gentleness. These are all in the realm of self-love, flattering speech, pretext for greed, glory from men. They would build up the communicator as he builds up the audience in order to build himself up. There is self-love going on here. But Paul demonstrates genuine sacrificial love for others, which is just so countercultural. Think about our culture that's just so focused on self-love, self-care. Paul's saying he did not come like that. He came focused on them. And it was demonstrated in his gentleness. And he actually gives us some evidences of self-love here. These three ways that he did not come would be evidences of self-love. So look at them one at a time. He says he did not come with flattering speech. Flattery, this would be puffing someone else up to get something in return. Right, you give compliments to the hearer so that they will receive your message. Maybe they'll give you back some, some respect, admiration. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna build you up, but really I'm just, because I wanna be liked, because I wanna be approved. I wanna following, so I'm gonna say things to the audience that they'll like, that they wanna hear so that the speaker can have more followers, more listeners. Think about a salesman. If you ever bought a car, and there's some godly car salesmen in our, in our church, so it's not all salesmen, but uh, just the, the salesman is gonna build you up. They're gonna compliment you. They're not, they're not telling you hard things. They're telling you what you wanna hear. Hey, you're doing a great job. You're making a great purchase. All right, this is, this is what salespeople do. I, uh, our water heater broke a couple months ago, so I called a guy to come fix it, and he uh, turned on to, to sales mode because he wanted me to replace the water heater, and he kept saying, you're a, you're, man, you're a family man. I can tell you're a family man. I can tell you care about your kids. And he said, you know, over and over, I'm not trying to sell you anything, but, you know, it's like, I just want hot water to wash my dishes, you know. But... But that's the salesman, right? They don't tell you hard things. They build you up. They encourage you. You're making a great choice. And Paul is saying he brought hard truth to them. He wasn't there trying to flatter them. Paul wasn't a con man. He, he didn't just give them the warm fuzzies. There were hard conversations. There were admi admonitions. Paul did not come to be liked, to flatter others so that he could gain approval for himself. We talked about this last week, but there's, in our gospel proclamation, there, there are hard truths for the hearer. Hard truths that, that man on his own is actually an enemy of God, is a rebel, has no hope on his own, apart from God. A gospel without preaching hard truths of the Bible about man's condition is not honest. It's just flattery. Telling someone that God cares about them. God loves you. He has a wonderful plan for your life. God's word does not say that to them. Paul did not come that way. He did not come flattering. And you see how strong this temptation is to be liked by men, to come in a way that people would respond well to. This give and take with the listener. You know, I'll, I'll puff you up if you puff me up. But that's a focus on self. And ultimately, that's not love for the listener, right? That's love for the speaker who just wants a, a following, who wants to feel good. 
And second evidence of self-love he gives, he says, we did not come with pretext for greed. The pretext for greed, this would be a pretext, would be a front, a smokescreen for greed. He actually says, we didn't come pretending to be godly, but with ulterior motives, actually greed, we want to get something from you. Could be financial gain, could just be a platform. Obviously, you think about the, the pastor with the private jet, extravagant lifestyle. You know, there's just blatant hypocrisy there. But there's more subtle ways that that would manifest. Someone that just wants influence, wants people to look up to them, wants to be the answer man, wants to be needed. You know, there's a, there's a self-focus here. There's a smokescreen for godliness, he's saying, with a pretext, actually a desire for something else. Something self-serving. Think about someone, you could come to church with just a desire for friends. Church is a great place to, to make friends, to build community, people that are like-minded, same walk of life, same, same hobbies as you. Maybe they vote the same as you. It's a good way to make friends. But you could see how someone could have a smokescreen for godliness with impure motives to say, I just want something for myself. I want something that feels good. I want community but as a subservient to, to pleasing the Lord, do I want to please the Lord first? So you see Paul saying, I didn't come that way. I didn't come wanting anything from you. There's no materiality here that Paul wants. No money, nothing from them. The one who would have this pretext for greed, you see this materialism here is the goal, being consumed by the world, wanting stuff, comfort, an easy life, self-pleasure, and just think about how impossible it is to live sacrificially for others, to love others well, if you are after your own comfort and your own pleasure. We can't live sacrificially for others if we're after our, our own comfort, our own pleasure, what feels good for us. There's no sacrifice there. The last evidence Paul gives of this self-love that he is not demonstrating would be an evidence of self-love, would be seeking glory from men. It's pretty straightforward. Paul's saying, I didn't come after the approval of men. He was not after fame, influence, being liked by the world. He didn't need men to validate him. Again, are you content to be nothing in this world, to have no glory in this life, just to have the Lord's approval, just to have glory from the Lord, to see him honored? And this desire for pleasure from men, glory from men is so strong. Just think about just selfish ambition in our hearts to, to want approval from others, to want significance, to want people to like us. And that would make you an unfaithful witness to want the approval of men. We're not gonna say hard things, hard truths if we're after men's approval. But Paul is gonna give the contrast here gives the contrast of not seeking glory from men, not coming with false motives for greed. And it's not, it's not what we would expect again. He's saying first, think about just the, the things, the other two points of these characteristics of Paul's bold proclamation. He's driven by, by faithfulness, not results. So he's coming to them boldly. He's coming to them with the authority of God, the authority of King Jesus. So you're thinking like this crescendo building, like he's coming with authority, he's coming with boldness, like Paul's gonna bring the hammer down on them. I think about Jeremiah 23, 29. Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like the hammer that breaks the rock to pieces? So at this point you might be thinking, okay, Paul is gonna say these hard truths, you know, with a two by four for Jesus. And he says, I was not like this, but I was gentle. He was gentle like a nursing mother. And just think about the contrast there. Paul's bold proclamation under authority, saying hard things, and yet gentle, like a, like a mother of a newborn. That's how his evident love manifested itself. His love for them manifested in his gentleness. You hear about different uh, pastors, there's a podcast right now about a, a mega church, the rise and fall of this mega church, and uh, just talk about the, the gruffness of the leadership, 
the shortness, you know, yelling at, at people in the leadership team, uh, self-willed. Just think about self-willed men are not gentle. People who want to get their own way at all costs are not gentle. When someone gets in front of their agenda, that person becomes gruff, does whatever they can to, to coerce that person to agree with them. But, but gentleness would be a, an evidence of, of sacrificial love, someone who wants what's best for somebody else. With God as the authority, they're gonna be gentle. I just think about the elders of this church, the pastors of this church. Just think about the 11 men on our elder board. I think about across the board, if I had to pick a, a characteristic of those men, I think gentleness would be right at the top of the list. Every man, gentle. The way that they parent, the way they are with their spouses, they're gentle. You know, it's one of the elder qualifications is gentleness. Paul is not on a megaphone yelling at people, telling them that they're sinners. He is gently rebuking, correcting, loving them, telling them hard truths, as gracious, as gentle as he is able. And he demonstrates that he's in it for their good by his gentleness. And he says, like a, like a mother to a newborn, if you just hand a two-month-old baby, a three-month-old baby to any woman in this room, you could see the, you know, the ooh-ah, the, the gentleness, the change in disposition when someone's handed a baby. And that's what Paul is using as an example for his ministry. And it's just so helpful. Just think about how important this is. When you're thinking about hard conversations, bringing hard truth to bear, these, these truths of the gospel that implicate people, that are hard to receive, just think about how necessary it is to be gentle, to be gracious, to have a soft disposition regardless of response. Again, Paul is, is being persecuted here, consistently persecuted, and he can say, and he's still gentle, even in the midst of hostility. Think about in your parenting, think about how gentleness is a, is a good indication of, of what we're going after in parenting. When we're after our own agenda, when kids get in the way of our agenda, when our spouse gets in the way of our agenda, just think about how quick we are to not be gentle, to be gruff, to try to force someone to do what we want when we're in it for ourselves. Paul here is saying he is gentle, demonstrates his sacrificial love, his care for them. And look at the end of, of verse 7 and verse 8. He says he tenderly cares for them like a, a nursing mother cares for her children. Verse 8, having so fond an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become very dear to us. Paul is saying he, he actually gives them his own life. He tenderly cares for them whatever they need. There's no self-focus here from Paul. He actually says that he has the authority as an apostle. He could actually make a claim against them to, to support him. When he says we did not come, that we had authority here, he's actually saying in verse six, he says, though as apostles, we might have asserted our authority. He's saying they're, they're apostles sent by Jesus to, to ask these people to support them financially, to give them food and lodging. They had authority to do that. They're apostles of, of Jesus, right? If anyone is worthy of his wages, it's Paul, right? If any missionary should have been supported, it was Paul. But he's saying he didn't ask them for anything. No support, no financial resources. And that proved his, his motivation of sacrificial love to them. That he's willing to do whatever it took. That this life on life ministry, right? Getting his hands dirty, serving them regardless of the cost going outside of himself, being inconvenienced, late nights, long hours, for their sake. And we just see this model of, of evangelism, of discipleship from Paul, this sacrificial love, willing to do whatever it costs for their sake, imparting his own life to them. Think of just the inconvenience, discomfort, and again, just the, the newborn baby analogy is so helpful that Paul uses, a, a mother with a newborn that there's no thanks. Newborn babies don't say thank you. 
They don't recognize the hard work. You change diapers, you stay up late, you work hard, no appreciation. That's what Paul is like. He's not in it for them in the sense that he wants their approval. He's in it for them in the sense that he wants them to believe. He cares about their souls. He cares about spiritual fruit. So he's willing to do whatever it takes to serve them. And that's what Paul models here. He models sacrificial love. No thought of self. But how does he pour himself out in love for them? So that's our third characteristic, last characteristic. This sacrificial love, not a self-love. So you hear a lot, or at least maybe I've heard a lot, you know, speaking the truth in love. You hear this, like, speak the truth in love. And I think you have a lot of different, people mean a lot of different things by that. But here you have this great example from Paul of, of truth and love, never compromising truth, never backing away from a hard conversation, and sacrificially loving, being patient, being gentle, doing whatever it takes. So he's not watering down the message. He's not being man-centered. He's being bold and authoritative, preaching God's message and he is a humble messenger, just pleading with others to believe this message, the only message by which sinners can be saved. So we must say what God says, only what he says, and we must say it on God's terms. We must do that as patiently, as humbly, as gently as possible with God as our witness. Would you pray with me as we close? God, we just thank you again for your word. I just pray for the men and women, children in here, that you would just uh, work in our hearts to make us bold evangelists, that we would be so consumed by thoughts of you, by your glory, that we would be quick to speak your truth, Lord, because we love you and because we love others. We want to see you magnified in Tempe, in Gilbert, in New Orleans, in Papua New Guinea, Lord, around the world. I pray that we would be faithful evangelists. Pray these things, Jesus, in your name. Amen. All right, you are dismissed until 10.15. Thank you.